Hello all, welcome to Samvad Talks. I'm Shalini Singh, a student volunteer with the IIITB Branding Committee, and I'll be introducing the speakers in the talk. Today's talk is on image analysis in medical diagnosis and precision agriculture by Professor Neelam Sinha and team, which includes Dibanjali Bhattacharya and Adharva Kadik Thangkar. Firstly, I would like to introduce Neelam Ma'am. Neelam Sinha is an associate professor at IIITB. She received her PhD from IIC Bangalore. Her previous stints includes my lab. IAC and MR Imaging Group at GE Healthcare, Bangalore. Her research interests are predominantly in medical imaging and processing. Professor Neelam has actively collaborated with several organizations such as NIMHANS and her work is well funded by grants from the government of Karnataka and the government of India. Apart from her research and teaching duties, Professor Neelam also serves as the faculty in charge of the Institute Newsletter. Coming to her team, Dibanjali Bhattacharya is a PhD scholar working towards a thesis on MRI image signatures in neurodegeneration and neurooncology. She will be presenting her work on the analysis of MR brain images in collaboration with doctors from Nimans. Her work has been well published, a recent one being in Frontiers in Neuroscience, with her as the first author. Atharva is a Master of Science by research scholar working toward his thesis on applying computer vision in precision agriculture. He will be presenting his work on detecting diseased coconut grounds in collaborations with researchers from General Aeronautics, a startup at ISC. Today's talk will cover key aspects of both Devangeli's and Atharva's thesis. Now, I'll request Neelam Ma'am and her team to start the talk. Hello all, so glad to be back in the Samvad Forum. So the topic for today is image analysis for medical diagnosis and precision agriculture. To begin with, I want to uh, express my gratitude to some of the organizers who give us this chance to uh, present the work that we are doing in front of the entire institute. And I want to thank everyone at IIIT for the wonderful ecosystem, our very supportive collaborators at NIMHANS and General Aeronautics. As we all know, imaging is everywhere. Healthcare, in every aspect of healthcare is covered by some sort of imaging biometrics, we've all gone through the Aadhaar procedure. Text-to-speech conversion has it. Precision agriculture has it. Video surveillance is all about imaging well. Satellite imaging, underground imaging, imaging for fun. You just name it and imaging is there. In today's talk, we will look at two different domains. Its role in medical diagnosis and its role in precision agriculture just some tiny bits of work that our team has done in this. Now the impact of imaging, almost always the very first step in automation starts with imaging. But this has to be followed up with adequate analysis. So when we say adequate, we mean loads of computer vision, lots of statistics, traditional ML, the modern ML, all of these have to be combined to build deployable systems. So one very simple example where we see uh, a working system is Aadhaar, biometric identification. All of us have gone through it. And a big work in progress is driverless cars. Imaging plays a very crucial role in all of these. In healthcare, you would call it computer-assisted diagnosis, where the idea is to help the doctor in any which way so that the diagnosis becomes more reliable and simpler. So a very simple example I picked up from a, a website in UK. So there is a, a real service that's offered. You see this, a diabetic patient comes over to the clinic. He gets his uh, eye examined by a technician. Here by examining, we just mean that the picture of his eye is taken with a fundus camera. That's all the technician needs to know. And what after that? It's given to an AI system. And you see the report is available in less than a minute. So the screening is done then and there. So you know if the patient has to be sent for expert uh, evaluation or this is it. So this is very much operational and very much real time. So it's a reality. So there are many examples of these CAD systems coming from research groups. I've just picked up uh, few important ones that we see from Stanford and Google. This is from Stanford, the group by, uh, led by Andrew Nick. So he's come up with what is called Chexpert, 
where there are tons of x-rays taken of patients suffering from several lung diseases. And they've come up with a system, an expert system that is able to evaluate the x-ray and tell what the disorder is. And they claim that their performance is much better than several radiologists too. Yet another example, I got this from Google AI blog. So there's a, a histopathological image here, the one you see here. To the naked eye, the difference between the tumor, which is cancerous, and the benign macrophage is not very visible. But then it's possible to come up with an algorithm that will tell which is which. So this is a very big step. So which is why they say they're assisting pathologies, pathologists in detecting cancer with this kind of algorithm. So these are definitely at work. Now what goes into a CAD system, uh, a very high view of it. There is a sensor and image acquisition system. It acquires images of the anatomy that you want to evaluate. It's fed to a CAD processing system. And this comes up with some kind of diagnosis with the help of the doctor. The patient gets to know what best needs to be done. Now, this CAD processing here is very loaded. So what happens there? So CAD can help in several ways. Something as uh, fundamental as just visualizing the data that is captured by the sensor. Visualization. You could do something more on that segmentation, come up with some kind of quantification and maybe some kind of classification, which is what they call recognition here with some kind of modeling. And finally, help the doctor decide on what, what the problem could be, what the future course could be. So all these put together give you a more reliable diagnosis. So some of the very generic stages we see First, to decide on how good is the quality of the image which is taken by the sensor. It, the question that at first we want to answer is, is the acquired image of diagnostic quality? If yes, then you go ahead with the analysis and you know that the analysis could be reliable. So assessing the quality of the input is very important. So here the intention is not to correct the image, but to decide whether to go ahead with the analysis or not. So for instance, an image of the eye, the one you see on the left would be a bad quality image. The image on the right would be a good quality image. So I'd like the CAD system to tell me if the image is of good quality, which is when I go ahead with the analysis. So this is what we want, a two-way classifier. Tell me what the quality is, good or bad. How else could it help? Screening. So I just can feed an image to the CAD system and it should tell me if it's coming from a healthy subject or an unhealthy subject. So this goes a long way in reserving the expert's time for treating the really unhealthy cases. What more can be done? Segmentation. So I could say segment the normal landmarks or segment out the tumors, right? So if I want the system to come up with all the tumor segments, and let us say this is the ground truth. So this is a picture of a liver with tumors marked by an expert, and that's called the ground truth. And let us say the segmentation algorithm works on the image and gives me an output like this. Now to the untrained eye, it looks as if everything is in place, but then there is a small chunk that got missed out. And it could so happen that it's very critical. It's very true in medical images because a tiny tumor could mean the start of the start of something bad in a region which was actually considered to be good. So you need to come up with an evaluation metric that penalizes this tiny missing chunk. One more of the generic stages could be explainability. Can you tell the doctor if the label given to the image is unhealthy, why is it so? So we have done some toy experiments towards that. So we looked at classifying between the digits zero and eight. And as we all know, 
that it is this region that is critical in deciding if the written digit is zero or eight. There should be a pinch right at the middle. So with our toy experiments, we've been, come up, we've been able to come up with measures where for these pixels, the measure is so different. Whereas for all other pixels you see, the measure is entirely different. So it is possible to tell which are the pixels, which are the locations in the image that gave rise to that particular label. With lots of advancements happening in computer vision, it's very uh, uh, enticing to think of just adapting those advancements straight away. For example, if I give a picture like this to a good classification segmentation algorithm, it will clearly tell me which region is the background sky, which region is the grass, where's the tree. So this is no big deal at all. It's, it's very well doable in real time, it's all studied very well. So where is the challenge? Now, in this kind of a segmentation, what if I have a tiny region that got mismatched? Let us say someone says it's grass there or it is sky there. So such small differences do not change interpretation or for a real world image. But the same thing for medical images is not true. So if this is the image of the eye that we have, the region that we are looking for are these tiny white chunks called the exudates. And this is what the segmentation gave me. So as you see, even a tiny chunk can play a very big role in the interpretation. So the tiniest chunk can make a huge difference here. And typically the kind of regions we are looking at occupy, this is around uh, one, one over 10,000 percentage of the image, which is a very, very tiny fraction, right? So adapting the algorithms made for real world images to make them work on medical images is not easy. Yet another example is with texture analysis. So in real world image, if someone tells you there's a difference in texture here, they show you fine sand and they show you coarse pebbles, pebbles they show you the, uh, the shore. It's very easy to distinguish what's what. It doesn't need a trained eye to do that. Whereas in medical images, when you are given images like this, so these are MR scans of the brain, and you are told that this is glioma grade three and this is glioma grade four. You are told that there are rich textural differences between them, and that has to be exploited to figure out the grade. So as you can see to the uh, layman, it's not easy to make out where the differences lie and how to convert these differences so that classification becomes simple. Now I'll list some of the challenges that the community works on. Everyone wants to do their bit towards fighting COVID. So there is a imaging challenge on COVID-19 where the focus is on analysis of X-rays and CT scans. These are supposed to be very critical in uh, the upkeep of the patient, deciding the, the course of uh, treatment to be given. Yet another is the multimodal brain tumor segmentation challenge it's going on for a decade or so now. So here what is given are, so we have MR images of brains with tumors with four different contrasts, the T2 contrast, T2 flare, T1 contrast, and the T1 weighted image. As you can see, the same tumor manifests very differently in each of these. So the challenge is to fuse all the information from these four contrasts, put them together and figure out the right delineation of the tumor. So what we are seeing is for subject one and subject two. So as you can see, the tumor manifests very differently. So how do you put together all the information and figure out where the tumor is? So this is the objective of the analysis. You need to tell which is the non-tumorous part, the normal part of the brain, the tumor core, the enhancing region, the necrotic region, the edema. So the idea is to utilize all of the information from all the four contrasts to come up with this kind of a classification. Yet another uh, very important initiative in understanding neurological diseases is ADNI, which works on Alzheimer's. So here they have, there is open access to 
uh, imaging modal images, time series images, in fact, fMR, the diffusion weighted images, they have a lot more uh, statistical data of the patients. So they want to put together um, the study to figure out how the disease progresses, how it can be tackled. It's going on for more than a decade. And there are several uh, other challenges, like the Cancer Imaging Archive, which is meant to image discoveries and developments towards understanding cancer biology. And then there is the segmentation challenge called the decathlon. It so turns out that every anatomy needs a different kind of uh, approach. So how do you come up with a generalizable segmentation scheme? So in fact, this challenge is over 10 anatomies. Now moving on to another domain, the domain of precision agriculture. How do we extend uh, our learnings from computer vision, our learnings from real world images, apply them for precision agriculture? And this is thanks to the Agritech project proposal initiated by Dr. Kota. One of our students, Atharva, got interested in this. So the kind of things you can do with this, just to name a few, crop monitoring, identifying diseases in the very early stages to estimate yields. What are the challenges they face? The input images are the top view of the plantation. So these are images taken by the cameras mounted on the drones. So it's not the frontal image that we see. And the image quality could be very adversely impacted by motion, motion of the camera, motion of the crop, wind, the different lighting conditions. So our group at IIIT is working on some of these problems. I've just listed a few. Study of neurological disorders using MR images. Nimhans is a very big collaborator here. Diverse aspects of CAD, where we look at quality assessment, segmentation evaluation metric. So here we are thankful to all those who publicly allowed their data to be used by researchers. Object detection and classification in precision agriculture. This is thanks to General Aeronautics and the CPCRI group. And a very pilot study in causal analysis towards understanding interclass differences. The main agenda of today's Samvad will be taken forward from here by Devanjali, our PhD student, who will speak on uh, a part of her thesis topic, quantitative MRI image signatures in neurodegeneration and neuro-oncology, after which Atharva will speak about the work he's done towards his thesis, deep learning-based disorder detection in coconut trees for precision agriculture. Now I hand over to Devanjali. Good afternoon, everyone. So my thesis is on quantitative MRI image signatures in neurodegeneration and neuro-oncology. Uh, neuro uh, in today's talk, uh, I will discuss my two research work. The first one is on corpus callosum subregion characterization based on LPP texture in patient uh, with Parkinsonian disorders. And uh, second one is the MRI image signature to predict chromosomal arms 1P19Q cotyledon status in glioma. So the first word uh, basically focus on starting the textural changes on uh, in brain corpus callosum. And this work is performed in collaboration with Dr. Chitendar Saini, neuroradiologist of Tim Hans. The main motivation behind this work was to examine how brain corpus callosum structure is affected due to Parkinsonism in Indian population. So we deeply acknowledge Dr. Saini's continuous support and guidance in conducting this research. So let's uh, briefly explain what is corpus callosum and what are different subregions of corpus callosum. So corpus callosum is the largest white matter structure in brain that uh, connects to cerebral hemisphere and enables all kinds of interhemispheric communication. So white matter is the tissue through which messages pass between different areas of gray matters in central nervous system. And uh, hence, it uh, facilitates quicker transmission of information in different gray matters in CNS. Now, as corpus callosum is the largest uh, white matter structure consisting of more than 300 million fiber tracks, so subtle changes in corpus callosum may correlate with uh, cognitive and behavioral deficits that is seen in neurodegenerative diseases. 
Now, due to its size, uh, corpus callosum is usually subdivided into uh, different regions in order to facilitate the study of a specific portion. But as there are no visual landmark in CC that uh, allows its subdivision in mid sagittal plane, so various uh, corpus callosum uh, geometric parcellation methods have been proposed. And the main motivation behind this corpus callosum subdivision is to check how the callosal fibers are connected to different regions of cortex. And the two most common and widely used corpus callosum subdivision scheme is Wittelson scheme and Hoffer scheme. Now, according to Wittelson, he divided uh, he, uh, the corpus callosum into five vertical partition, anterior third, anterior midbody, posterior midbody, isthmus, and splenium. So for example, the first region, it consists, it, that is the anterior third. So it consists of one third of the entire CC. So the fibers originating in prefrontal, premotor, and supplementary motor area are assumed to pass through this region. But there are several drawbacks of Wittelson scheme. Uh, the most important drawback is it uh, could not able to reflect uh, callosal texture at cellular level. Hence, a better classification scheme has been proposed by Hoffer in the year 2006 uh, based on the outcome of TTI fiber tractography. So, uh, Hoffer divided the corpus callosum into five vertical subdivision uh, for uh, in accordance with the outcome of TTI fiber tractography. That means how the density and the the diameter of fiber tracks varies anterior to posterior. So for example, here uh, region one consists of one sixth of the entire CC and it consists of fibers projecting into prefrontal regions of cortex. In our study, we have used both Wittelson's and Hoffer scheme for the analysis. So the aim of our study is of number one, to identify the paste corpus callosum subregion that corresponds to highest callosal texture alteration that occur due to Parkinsonism. And the second one is utilize these changes in callosal texture in order to address the differential diagnosis. The data set are collected from Nimhans and the patient group consists of cognitively normal Parkinson's disease um, and the two atypical variants of typical Parkinson's disease. One is multiple system atrophy or MSA and the second one is progressive supranuclear pulse, pulse or PSV. And we have used here total 80 number of subjects where each disease group consists of 20 subjects. And for comparison purpose, we have used two uh, control, 20 healthy control subjects with mean age of 55 years. This is the block diagram of the proposed methodology. So I will explain each and every block. So from uh, MRI brain uh, volume, first we have cropped the mid sagittal corpus callosum image manually. And within the corpus callosum image, we have extracted all possible ROIs within CC. So here all the re rectangular uh, box, the red square box, it shows the all the ROIs which are extracted and which are well within the CC. And the size of the ROI is five plus five uh, that ensures that the entire CC is uh, exhaustively covered because we have seen that if the ROI, if the size is more than five plus five, say for example, six by six, then uh, some regions of corpus callosum will not cover it. So for healthy control, the, uh, we have taken the ROI of size five plus five, but for disease group, it is four by four because we have seen uh, corpus callosum thickness reduction throughout the CC. So some ROIs are highlighted in blue here. So uh, per, uh, for each subject from each corpus callosum, we have extracted uh, around 300 ROIs. After ROI extraction, we have extracted the LPP texture features. So the next task is local uh, binary pattern texture feature extractions. So LPP values are calculated from each selected ROIs for all the subjects in the data set. And as the sizes of the ROIs are very small, so we choose only one combination of neighborhood pixels with P equal to eight with and radius one. And we have extracted two LPP texture features, energy and entropy. Then SVM classification. So here we have basically done the ROI classification of each disease group versus control group. So the computed LPP texture features in each ROI are fed to the two class SVM classifier for the following scenarios. One is PT versus healthy control, MSA versus healthy control, and PSV versus healthy, healthy control. And the result of this classification gives the correctly classified ROIs. So what are the ROIs so, which are correctly classified? Say I have this colored region showed the ROIs which are correctly classified based on LPP energy. So as you can see, 
the yellow uh, colored it shows the ROIs which are correctly classified in case of PT. So these are the ROIs which are correctly classified in case of PT. Similarly, this red color showed the ROIs which are correctly classified in case of PSP, in case of MSA. Uh, the green one shows the ROIs which are correctly classified in case of PSP. Similar to healthy control, as you can see, almost all are extracted ROIs are correctly classified as the ROIs of healthy control. So as you can see, for TCS groups, there are some misclassification that happens. So what it means, it means that there is texture, uh, there is alteration in texture characteristics uh, as a result of Parkinsonian disorders. And these texture alterations are not same. It varies from anterior to posterior. So based on this, we have computed correct classification ratio or CCR values. So CCR is defined as the ratio of number of correctly classified ROIs to the total number of ROIs for a specific subregion. So for each subject in a specific class, this CCR value tells the fraction of ROIs which are correctly classified in each subregion of CC. Thus, CCR value enables one to identify the uh, corpus callosum subregions which are most affected by the texture alteration in Parkinsonian disorders. After this, we have generated uh, the CCR, based on the CCR values, we have gener generated the CCR rank matrix as well as uh, we have generated the corpus callosum subdivision based on Wittelson and Hoffer scheme. So the next task is corpus callosum subregion ranking based on the obtained CCR values. So how it is done? Uh, so for each subject in a specific class, the CCR values for every subregion is sorted in the descending order. So as I'm explaining it here, so if we have five uh, corpus callosum subregions and for 20 number of subjects, for each subject, the CCR values are sorted in the descending order. So it is maximum to minimum. Subsequently, the five callosal subregions are also sorted, where the first element contains the CC subregion index with the highest CCR value, and the last element contains the CC subregion index having the least CCR values. Thus, a sorted array is obtained for each subject. So as now we have 20 number of subjects, so these subject-specific sorted arrays are stacked together to form a matrix of size 20 cross 5 which is called CCR rank matrix. Why 20 cross 5? Because we have 20 number of subjects and we have five callosal subregions. Thus, the CC subregion index of the first column will give the best performing subregions having the highest texture alteration. And we name this column as array of importance that reflects the CC subregions with highest texture alteration for all subjects in a specific class. So at the end, we obtained the key callosal subregions for all the subjects having the highest texture alteration. Now, after obtaining these best callosal subregions having the highest texture alteration, the next task is to check how consistent uh, this highest texture alteration is across all the subjects of a specific class. So for this, we have computed a new matrix, which is scattered index. So scattered index, uh, basic, it is basically a measure of dispersion and it tells how scattered or localized the texture alteration is within CC for a particular disorder. Uh, so how uh, scattered index is calculated. So for a given subject, the frequency of occurrence of CC subregions in AI across all the subjects is used to measure the frequency coefficient of variation. If a certain subregion index in AI performs the best classification across all the subjects in a given disorder, it would mean that the texture alteration is highly localized within that subregion. Whereas if the subregions that perform based in classification vary across uh, subjects, it would mean that the texture alteration is spread over several subregions for that particular class. This leads to the notion of scattered index, which we have proposed to measure the degree of spread in highest texture alteration for a disorder. Mm -hmm. So the significance of scattered index lies in finding the consistency in highest texture alteration regions across all subjects for a particular disorder. So how scatter index is computed? So this is the formula of scatter index. Scatter index is equal to exponential of minus FCP. So FCP means frequency coefficient of variation. 
so uh, first we have computed what is the max what is the what are the ideal values of scattered index that is what is the maximum values of scattered index and what is the minimum values of scattered index if there are 20 subjects and five subregions so we have and uh, these ideal values are computed Uh, by assuming two ideal cases the first one is if the frequency of occurrence of each five subregions are distributed equally across all subjects in ai so that means the uniform occurrence so if occurrence is uniform then the relative frequency will be 0.2 if there are 20 subjects and five a uh, subregions so in that case we will get the coefficient uh, frequency coefficient of variation is zero so i have used frequency fcp or frequency coefficient of variation as the analysis is based on the relative frequency so uh, this fcp value will be zero if the occurrence is uniform so using this formula we will get the maximum value of scattered index is equal to 1 and the case 2 is if single frequency of occurrence of any one subregion across subjects in ai so in that case for single occurrence the relative frequency will be 1 frequency coefficient of variation we will get 2 and the scattered index will be 0.135 so this ideal values of scattered index it it lies between 0.135 to 0.1 so one means the regions with uh, texture alteration are maximum uh, maximally scattered and if the value is close to 0 or if the ideal value is close to 1.135 it means that the texture alteration is highly localized within a particular subregion so in context of our study we can say that in a space specific class if scattered index if si is close to 0.135 then the texture alteration is more localized for that given disorder similarly if scattered index value if it is close to 1 then the texture alteration is more scattered for that particular disorder and we have calculated also calculated the percentage of scattered index which is scattered index calculated and it is subtracted from the ideal mean value that is Point one three five. Why it is subtracted from the ideal mean value? Because we want to check how localized it is. So this percentage of scattered index is calculated using this formula. Now for our disorder, for our subjects, we have seen that the percentage of scattered index is more. It is forty seven percent in case of cognitively normal Parkinson disease. whereas in case of atypical variants that is in case of msa it is only 25% in case of psp it is much less it is only 15% according to hoffer scheme so frequency coefficient of variation it increases in case of uh, atypical variants of parkinsonian disorder compared to the simple parkinson disease so we can say that here if the coefficient value uh, coefficient of variation if fcp value increases the scattered index value decreases uh, as a result the percentage of scattered index will also decrease so which indicates that the texture alteration is localized within few corpus callosum subregion now we have plotted how scattered or localized it is for all the disease group for that uh, along x axis we have plotted the ccr values and along y axis it is the five callosal subregions so y axis 1 2 3 4 5 means the so 5 means region 5 4 means the corpus callosum subregion 4 3 means the corpus callosum subregion 3 and so on so for ms and psp we can see that uh, so for ms and psp this red uh, Square and the green circle. Uh, these are the subjects for MSC and PSV. And what we can observe that the highest texture occur alteration is more localized in mid callosal regions. That is in region three and four in case of MSC and PSP. Whereas in case of Parkinson disease, the highest texture alteration is scattered from region one to region five. so based on this observation based on the ccr values now the next task is to whether this can be used to address the differential diagnosis so we we use the spm classification to classify the disease groups so psp versus msa uh, pt versus psp and pt versus msa so this uh, using ccr values obtained using lpp energy features were, was used to address the differential diagnosis and as you can see we have got 82% accuracy to classify pt versus msa the highest classification accuracy is obtained as 90% uh, in classifying pt versus psp and uh, between msa and psp the classification accuracy is obtained as 80% 
So the novelty of this study lies in deriving the scatter index as a measure of dispersion in order to detect the most distinguished corpus callosum subregions with highest texture alteration. And the proposed method showed the callosal texture alteration is more localized at callosal meat potty, especially for atypical variants of PT, that is in case of MS and PSP. So quantification of changes in callosal tissue at meat potty, it can be used as a possible biomarker in computer-aided diagnosis of part. Parkinsonian disorder. The next focus of presentation is uh, very different from Parkinsonian disorder. It is, uh, we have used glioma. So the next is MRI image signature to predict chromosomal ARM1P19Q cotyledon status in glioma. So coming to glioma, what is glioma? Glioma is the most common primary brain tumor that is occurred due to growth of abnormal cells within the tissues of brain. And it is called glioma because it is produced within different clear cells of brain. So glioma is an umbrella term that is used to describe different types of clear tumors. Now the neuropathological evaluation and the diagnosis of brain tumor, it is performed according to WHO classification. So who classified glioma by cell origin and how the cell behave from least aggressive to most aggressive, that is from grade one to grade four. So we can see that glioma vary uh, in their aggressiveness and malignancy. So some uh, are uh, slow growing like grade one glioma, they are slow growing and likely curable. And some are fast growing, invasive and very difficult to treat. Now, there are many characteristics that influence glioma progression. One is environmental risk factor, that is our physical activity level, uh, then eating or non-eating certain food, consuming alcohol, tobacco, etc. And there is another risk factor that cannot be ignored, that is the genetic risk factor. Now, it is seen that only 5 to 10 percent of all cancer are hereditary. Most of the cases, it is not inherited at part. It builds up over time as a change in a DNA sequence of gene. So deeper genetic analysis on glioma sample discovers the presence of mutation in majority of who created gliomas. It is seen that mutated gliomas are clinically and genetically very distinct from wild type gliomas. It is also seen that glioma caused due to mutation has a better clinical outcome than those without mutation. So this reforms uh, the WHO classification of tumor in the year 2016. So in 2016, uh, WHO classification of CNS tumor uses molecular parameter in addition to histology, and the tumor is classified based on its mutational status. So based on gene mutation, glioma is of two types. One is mutant and another one is wild type. So mutant glioma means if, if the glioma that occurred due to mutation, that that is if it occurs due to change in genetic sequence and wild type gliomas means the glioma that does not occur due to mutation. So wild type, it describes a gene when it is found it is in its natural and non-mutated form. There are uh, popular approaches of determining mutational status. So like DNA sequencing, then immunohistochemical staining and currently FISH test, that is the gold standard for determining the mutational status. But all these tests uh, are very invasive as they need the actual brain tissue which is affected and costly too. So the motivation of our study is to investigate non-invasively whether gene mutation is a key driver of glioma formation. Now I have uh, shown two types of glioma. The first row is glioma caused due to mutation. So I have uh, shown uh, consecutive three MRI slices of grade three ITH mutant glioma. And the bottom row shows the ITH wild type glioma. So these are the sub one subjects which are collected from Nimhans. Now, uh, while exploring these glioma images visually, we observe two things. The first one is the interslice MRI texture pattern in majority of gliomas that occur due to mutation are very homogeneous or very similar in nature. So slice to slice, uh, it is very similar. While the interslice texture pattern is random and heterogeneous in case of wild type gliomas. And the second observation is this heterogeneity increases with increase in glioma grades for both uh, mutant and wild type cases. So the objective of our study is to establish the validity of this visual observation, which is seen in mutant and wild type glioma. For this, we examine the frequency 
space texture characteristics in order to differentiate these two types of glioma classes. There is uh, one literature which is available that uses the MRI frequency space texture analysis that uses Fourier transform to measure the tissue alignment in standard MRI in case of patients suffering from multiple sclerosis. So our proposed method, in our proposed methodology, we uh, we derived radial cumulative frequency distribution aiming to quantify the changes in dominant orientation of tissue alignment across consecutive glioma slices. And the hypothesis is uh, that the change in dominant tissue orientation between consecutive slices is insignificant in glioma that occurred due to mutation. So the data sets are collected from TCIA. Uh, it contains uh, two different contrast, T1 weighted MRI and T2 weighted MRI images. The data included 57 non deleted and 102 co deleted grade 2 and grade 3 glioma subjects who had biopsy proven 1P 19Q status consisting of either uh, co deletion or non deletion. And the histolo histological subtypes of gliomas are you know, oligoastrocytoma and astrocytomas. And we have used total 477 slices, three slices per subject that include the one with largest tumor diameter and one below and above it. So these are some subjects. So T1 weighted MRI, these are the T2 weighted MRI. The first two rows are grade two glioma subjects. The third and fourth row represent the grade three glioma subjects. Three consecutive MRI slices of uh, grade two mutant, grade two wild type, grade three mutant, and grade three wild type. So the climber extraction, uh, uh, we have uh, extracted the climber portion from MRI. So climber portion from whole MRI was segmented using the ground truth provided by TCIA, where ground truth was as a mask to segment the whole tumor. So this is the ground truth, and this is the segmented tumor, segmented glioma. So uh, First, the MRI images of gliomas are converted to the polar images, pol polar Fourier using the polar Fourier transform. So the polar R theta plot or the polar Fourier plot is shown here. Now, this conversion of uh, FFT to PFT, it helps us to derive the two functions. First one is the distribution of all frequencies across all angles, which will give the size of the dominant texture. And the second one is distribution of all frequencies in a specific direction that will give the direction of dominant texture. Our proposed uh, methodology, it based on this second function as the size of dominant texture, it hardly ever changes due to uh, the predominance of low frequency pattern of MRI. So we define the RCFT as the cumulative distribution of all frequencies in a specific direction. Finally, RCFT of tumor volume is obtained by taking the mean RCFT of successive tumor slices. So I have... Uh, shown uh, here uh, the RCFT plot of two subjects. The first row is for uh, mutant, that is for 1P19Q co-deleted glioma, how the RCFT plot looks like. And the second one is for one wild type subject. So as you can see, for mutant subjects, slice to slice, the RCFT pattern, it is very similar. Whereas for wild type glioma, the RCFT pattern, it varies randomly. So in order to quantify these changes, uh, we have uh, we have used the change in uh, we have quantified what is the change in dominant direction of tissue alignment and we have obtained it from eigen factor of covariance between two successive rcft so the eigen factors are shown here so this one is the eigen factor for slice 1 and slice 2 this is the eigen factor slice 2 to slice 3 so Obviously, if the RCFT pattern is similar, the two eigen factors it points towards the same direction. Whereas, if RCFT pattern varies, the eigen factors it points a different direction. So, the eigen factor will also vary. So, first, the change in dominant direction of tissue alignment. What is the change in dominant direction of tissue alignment that we have quantified? Uh, simultaneously, we have also um, extracted other features from RCFT like energy of mean RCFT, peak energy, differences in a successive peak height, and Euclidean distance between uh, two successive RCFT. Now I have shown it for one subject. Now the question comes, how consistent is this characteristic for all the subjects in a particular class? For this, histogram statistic uh, is plotted. 
so the histogram pie chart it clearly reveals how the change in dominant tissue alignment varies across subjects for each class so if uh, histogram 0 to 0 0.1 means in pie chart it is the dark blue region it corresponds to 0 to 0 0.1 similarly the next region it shows the change in dominant tissue orientation if it varies between 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 similarly the third uh, section it, it shows if the change in dominant direction it varies from 0.2 to 0.3 like this so as we can see for three more that 61 percent of the total number of subjects it uh, shows that the change in dominant direction of tissue alignment it lies between 0 0.1 0 to 0 0.1 so say for example if we assume that the change in dominant direction of tissue alignment is insignificant if the value lies between 0 to 0 0.1 then this is true for 61 percent of grade 3 mutant subject the same is true for only 37 percent of grade 3 wild type subjects same with grade Two mutations. So for grade two mutation, it is true for 68% subject. For grade two wild type, this is true for 58% subjects. So this I have shown for T1 weighted MRI. For T2 weighted MRI, the distinction is more clear. So uh, using T2 weighted images, if I assume that uh, same, the change in dominant direction of tissue alignment, it is insignificant if the value lies between 0 to 0 0.1, then this is true for 75% of grade 3 mutant, whereas it is true for only 37%. For grade 2 mutation, this is true for 62% of the total subject. For grade 2 wild type, this is true for only 47% of uh, total subject. Now, these statistics uh, is summarized here in this table. So what we can observe from this table is the dominant direction of tissue alignment across consecutive slices will not change for majority of glioma that cause due to mutation. And these characteristics becomes more distinct as grade increases. So as you can see for grade three gliomas, the differentiation is more prominent compared to grade two glioma. So we have uh, next thing is to classify these two climate classes. For this, we have used Rasmus classification due to imbalance in data set. So what happens if the data if there is data imbalance? So as you can see from this uh, from this image, if if the majority class outnumbers the minority class, in those cases, the performance of the traditional classification models like SPM, NISP, place or logistic regression, it drops significantly because they tend to only predict the majority class where the minority classes are treated as noise and often ignored. So there is a high probability of misclassification of positive class or minority class by classifying all instances as the negative class. So RASPOS classification is designed to improve the performance of model, which is trained on skewed data. So RAS means random under sampling. So it randomly removes the examples from the majority class uh, for uh, in order to balance the data set. So Rasmus classification, as you can see, the training accuracy using Rasmus classification, we have obtained the highest training accuracy, which is 98.5% for grade two cases and 100% for grade three cases. And uh, this is the uh, performance measured using Rasmus classification on extracted RCFT features. So for grade two climbers, we have obtained uh, 74, 73% accuracy, but for grade three climbers, the accuracy increases to 82 percent so coming to conclusion uh, what we have done here is the frequency texture characteristics of mri glioma images that reveals significant differences in interslice uh, dominant orientation of uh, tissue alignment between mutant and glioma subjects so we have seen that the majority of glioma occur due to mutation have homogeneous appearance across MRI slices contrary to wild type gliomas and which uh, this uh, differentiation is more prominent as grade increases. So that is why for grade three glioma, we have obtained better classification compared to the grade two glioma. But we need to compare this uh, result or observation with other texture models that could able to classify mutant and wild type gliomas with better accuracy. So uh, that's all from my slide, from my side. Now, um, Atharva will present his work on uh, detecting the deceased coconut crown, uh, which is an application of computer fission in precision agriculture. So over to Atharva. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, 
uh, good afternoon everyone uh, today i will be discussing a part of my thesis work deep learning based uh, disorder detection in coconut trees for drone image analysis in precision agriculture done under the guidance of professor nilam sinha so a part of this work titled deep learning based uh, detection of rhinoceros beetle infestation in coconut trees using drone imagery is accepted at cv cvip 2020 conference this work was done in the collaboration with general aeronautics private limited a startup incubated at iisc bangalore and central plantation crops uh, research institute cpcri kasargod kerala the contents of the presentation are as follows the motivation data collection challenges and existing work uh, proposed approach results and future work and conclusion in coconut farms uh, traditional way of farming make it difficult for farmers to analyze and monitor coconut trees manually due to their height and plantation over the large areas india is among the top 3 countries for production in case of pest attack coconut are uh, are often infested by the rhinoceros beetle health and yield of coconut trees get directly affected due to rhinoceros beetle attack as the v shaped cuts make coconut tree vulnerable to other diseases and plant attacks v shaped cuts as seen in the in this image uh, shown by the red arrows are developed as beetle bore into the base of coconut crowns making the cuts in unopened leaves which result in v shaped uh, larger cuts after the uh, folds are open the 7% reduction in leaf area result in 13% nut yield drone imagery is advantageous for this uh, for its bird eye view of uh, farms helping in analysis of uh, coconut uh, crops from the top and identifying coconut tree crowns affected by rhinoceros beetle attack so we collected data uh, from the from the cpcri sites the drone was used for collection of data in this uh, video which i am sharing here you can see the data is uh, the drone is flown at the, uh, very high altitude uh, top of the coconut uh, coconut trees and it's flown across the uh, across the fields to collect the data so the drone used here is a general aeronautics private limited model name uh, ga3 multi rotor uav uh, isr us uh, you the images were collected from two different altitudes the 40 meter and 60 meter to bring the robustness to the data sets and to cover different environment scenarios we collected data from two different geo locations kasargod and kayamkulam both are the sites of cpcri where the uh, there is large plantation over hundreds of acre for coconut research and coconut development so we co collected these images in summer rainy and winter seasons total of 1212 rgb high dimensional images were collected the drone was flown in square wave pattern to cover maximum to cover maximum area and uh, there was 75% overlap in each image the 75% overlap is standard uh, is standard in the practice of uh, precision agriculture to collect vegetation data here you can see that the left image is of 40 meter altitude and the right image is of uh, 60 meter altitude in the 40 meter altitude image uh, you can see the uh, crowns which uh, coconut crowns which are covered are around 60 uh, 16 to 20 coconut crowns per image while in the 60 meter altitude image each image is covering around 24 to 30 coconut crowns per image so the for further analysis expert of uh, expert from cpcri uh, annotated collected data using label img annotation tool the individual coconut crown was identified and was annotated as uh, first label as uh, crowns with a total annotation of 9427 uh, images uh, individual crowns then uh, from the identified coconut crowns they detected the healthy crowns which were uh, around uh, 4200 and the rhinoceros beetle affected crowns the prb stands for pest rhinoceros beetle so uh, the annotations for the prb were uh, 5227 based on health condition uh, each individual uh, the uh, each individual crown was annotated and then used for the uh, training process for the uh, further process so in case of crown localization there are different challenges from input image uh, identifying and localizing 
coconut crown is the primary and important step every raw input image contains multiple coconut crowns uh, from the image you can see that this is 60 meter altitude image where you can see the background and foreground it's uh, due to color intensity it's we cannot differentiate by, uh, the background and foreground so even for humans to analyze coconut crowns individual identification of crown is needed while doing so it can be seen that due to the birds eye view the shadow of coconut crown can be seen in the background uh, here in the image you can see that crown and shadow both have similar shapes so sometimes the models uh, model can uh, identify these if model is trained to identify the shapes only then it can identify uh, these shadows as coconut crown so we, uh, these are the challenges which we can face due to the shadows similarly in uh, rainy season when uh, as we collected data in uh, rainy season and winter uh, we got to see that there is weed and intercropping also present in case of the different uh, uh, different scenarios so the sh shadows can be seen here and uh, weed growth can be seen in the background in different uh, Uh, seasons so when coming to the uh, background different backgrounds you can see that the soil texture also affect the uh, uh, our soil texture also affect the uh, classification model as you can see in this uh, same picture there are different uh, soil patches for the given coconut crowns as you can see here the red patch is here and uh, this patch uh, right right beside it is having gray background so these variation in texture can affect the uh, model's classification uh, and this is a common practice of uh, intercropping in in the coconut farms where uh, uh, here you can see that banana trees are planted alongside with the uh, coconut trees so these kind of uh, challenges we are going we are facing in the crown localization so with the existing work you can see that uh, there are some image processing based approaches and uh, there are deep learning based approaches so uh, this is nice quite nice area uh, there is a limited research in this area so uh, less literature is available here so uh, salim malik uh, proposed a uav based uh, uh, palm tree detection system uh, where he used uh, uh, sift for identification of uh, crown key points and then classifying those using uh, elm extreme learning machine so uh, they use the satellite imagery uh, it is uh, quite high altitude image so the details of coconut crown are not seen and uh, this method only works in case of desert as a background so the different background uh, background scenarios uh, are challenging to this uh, method then hung etl used a template matching based uh, method to identify different uh, different tree crowns from uh, general satellite images so as template matching uh, gives rigid boundaries uh, to the uh, to the uh, detection process so uh, and uh, as we pro provide the template if the uh, there is different or variation in uh, test subject it's not robust to those kind of uh, scenarios so in deep learning based work uh, de souza proposed a uh, flim process feature learning from image markers so here uh, their target was to identify crown and non crown detection so uh, what they did was uh, the data which they got uh, was having some coconut crowns and uh, uh, different scenarios where they uh, mark the coconut crowns in uh, in one color and uh, background in another color and they just pass it to the uh, classifier model so this process fails in case of multiple crown localization from single image and uh, back, uh, it's not uh, robust to the different background scenarios steven uh, steven putzman used uh, darknet 19 for coconut crown detection so here they used uh, high altitude image where they annotated the, uh, all the co all different coconut trees in the given uh, given the given uh, image and they trained darknet model on top of that so uh, so this process gave uh, good results in case of crown localization 
but uh, to analyze the crown further uh, their health monitoring and all so this process uh, is not ideal for such condition so in case of proposed approach so most of the existing work is focusing on detection of coconut trees only for adapted problem uh, problem statement to analyze coconut crowns and to generate health report based on that identification of crown and classification of it as healthy and non healthy is needed to do this we are proposing a two stage uh, two stage approach in which uh, first step is identification of crown localization uh, identification and localization of coconut crowns from image using irm and uh, second step is classification of localized coconut crown as healthy and prb that is uh, uh, rhinoceros beetle infested so in machine learning uh, machines are able to learn complex prediction rule by minimizing their training error and uh, the traditional ml practice empirical risk minimization erm is used to minimize the training error uh, complex scenarios where erm doesn't perform well Mar uh, arjoeski uh, proposed a modern modern uh, risk minimization technique called uh, invariant risk minimization irm in april 2020 uh, ml will be uh, performing with most accuracy when uh, ideal scenarios are met that is if uh, model is trained on all sort of data covering all the conditions using erm then we get uh, most accurate model but it's not practically possible to gather all sorts of data in real world problem for the adopted problem statement we are dealing with real world data we tried collecting data with various vari variation and scenarios but all the cases can't be covered so to deal with this uh, problem we are adopting for the first time uh, irm framework in this domain so uh, in ideal scenario true risk computes the average loss over all the possibilities over all the data uh, minimizing training error leads machine to into recklessly absorbing all the correlation found in the training data uh, so example here you can see the cow and camel uh, so if our classification model is given a data set of cows and uh, camel so most of the cows are uh, uh, most of the cows can be seen with the background of uh, farms or uh, grass so greenery is basically in the background and uh, camels are basically found in the desert areas so their background is like uh, yellow and all so but uh, when machine learn Uh, the data uh, uh, from the data while training they lead to minimize the error so uh, they recklessly learn all the things whatever uh, are the correlation so if 1000 images of cows are there machine will learn like uh, green is related to somewhat related to cow so when this kind of image comes uh, in the frame so like uh, cow is there and the background is of uh, yellow hay so what will be the answer by the model most of the time the authors reported that it was camel so in real world covering all the possibilities over all the data is impossible so uh, the irm principle is to learn invariance across all the environments and find data representation such that optimal classifier on top of that represents ma matches for all the environments that is if my classifier should uh, the my classifier should be able to learn features which are really meaningful to the class as we have seen in the previous slide in case of cow with the background and hay the formulation of this statement uh, can be seen in the equation 1 where we can we are focusing to, uh, focusing to minimize the risk over all the uh, over all the environments of data for the given classifier equation 2 and 3 are the simplified and uh, applicable version of equation 1 uh the regular loss functions are used here along with the penalty uh, for each environment e the pseudo classifier is assigned at the uh, start of training and optimized using gradient loss uh, gradient norm penalty for arm the traditional ml the arm loss is computed over data set considering that the given data is subset of total data available and uh, cover all the possible cases such that the loss will be closest to the true risk the process of finding loss function and minimizing it closest to the true risk is imperial risk minimization 
so this is uh, general loss minimization technique uh, and the formula formula for that so coming to the uh, proposed approach so this is our first step and uh, for the uh, for this first step we have developed irm based ground localization model the object detection architecture used for training the model was faster rcnn inception v2 pre train on ms coco dataset training was done for 8000 epochs uh, where the minimum erm loss the traditional machine learning uh, approach obtain uh, loss of uh, 0.5412 and uh, the modern machine learning uh, loss obtain the mini uh, obtain minimum value of 0.373 with some uh, with same conditions and uh, similar environment for uh, training irm loss it's in attending lower loss than the erm model in case of crown localization uh, we, these are the results which we are reporting here for uh, test purpose we have used 20% of uh, total data set that is uh, 2026 crown annotation comparing proposed proposed approach results with existing method the proposed method can be seen working better with respect to erm and other methods so in this in this image you can see that the ground truth Uh, ground truth is uh, there are bounding boxes for the ground truth and the results uh, the, the result bounding boxes are here and uh, with the overlap of ground truth with the uh, result bounding boxes you can see that the uh, bound boundness of the uh, result model uh, models result are pretty good in the result image as the uh, ground localization uh, images of crown localization bounding box represents the detection class and the models classification as you can see in the uh, in this uh, image here the models class is represented and the classification accuracy is given for each crown from these images it can be seen that model was able to identify individual coconut crowns uh, crowns with uh, different background scenarios as here crown were localized even though there are similar there is similar color intensity in the background and the uh, for crowns uh, the in case of shadows the model uh, for uh, identifying crowns uh, with respect to shadows uh, the model performed well there also as uh, there uh, no shadows were identifying during this uh, test test process uh, in this image you can see that even though there are different uh, background scenarios the background uh, patches are there the model performed well in both the cases uh, in case of uh, cross plantation the model was able to identify uh, proper coconut crowns uh, most of the time but uh, it failed in some cases like here you can see that the two banana trees are alongside uh, and the model is classifying them as coconut trees so Uh, as we have identified uh, and localized our uh, coconut crowns from uh, image now we want to check their health and uh, want to monitor what's happening there so uh, this is the next step of the proposed approach the classification of localized uh, coconut crowns so here uh, you can see that the uh, classification model is trained for two classes healthy and uh, rhinoceros beetle affected prb for classification purpose we have used uh, vgg16 pretrain model uh, which was chosen empirically uh, against different architectures the model was trained for 150 epochs after which the training accuracy started to saturate the irm we reported the irm uh, models training accuracy of 91.55 while uh, validation accuracy obtained was 90.30 uh, for erm uh, erm lost model the maximum training accuracy obtained was uh, 90.72% while the the uh, validation accuracy obtained was 86.26% the accuracy for irm based model uh, for test data was 84.64 and the accuracy for uh, erm based model was 80.31 uh, the five fold cross validation was uh, used to uh, check the validity of the model performance where the average training obtained uh, training accuracy obtained was 86.7% uh, and here you can see that the confusion matrix for the uh, test data where uh, model perform irm model performed uh, 84.64% accuracy 
So the uh, here you can see that we are comparing IRM, the modern machine learning based uh, loss optimization uh, classification model with uh, ERM, traditional machine learning based model. Uh, and their uh, classification accuracy is precision and uh, sensitivity specificity F1 score. So uh, we are comparing our own results here with IRM and ERM as uh, this is the benchmark in this field for coconut health monitoring. This is the uh, first time we are doing this thing. So in the results, you can see that the left image is uh, in this uh, ground truth image. Uh, the blue boxes are of healthy crown and the red boxes are of uh, PRB, the defected crown. And in the right side image, uh, green boxes are of uh, healthy classification and PRB are of, uh, uh, sorry, yellow boxes are of PRB, the defected classification. Here we we combine, uh, we stitch uh, three to four images together and uh, check the model performance for that. And uh, we got this kind of results where uh, blue, blue boxes are of uh, healthy and uh, uh, red boxes are of defected crowns. The limitations of proposed approach are like, uh, if, uh, as you can see here, the image is uh, annotated as healthy by the CPCRI scientist, but uh, the twist in these leaves, uh, the uh, different shapes of these uh, coconut trees are affecting the accuracy of the model. So the healthy crown was classified as PRB with 55% uh, accuracy and uh, it had the accuracy of 43% for healthy classification. So this kind of manual interventions and uh, uh, natural uh, natural things happening to the leaves are uh, affecting the crown, uh, crown classification accuracy. So for future work, the improving crown classification accuracy by studying false positive and false negative cases, uh, making classification model more robust to extreme scenarios like irregular leaves shape and uh, extending the classification task as we have developed it for uh, rhinoceros beetle attack, we can extend this work to development of uh, uh, and identification of different disease and pests in the coconut trees. So in conclusion, the contribution of uh, two concepts is uh, offered in the proposed work, IRM-based coconut crown localization and IRM-based uh, crown classification. The novelty lies in the adaptation of IRM-based framework in uh, precision agriculture and these areas of classification and localization. For uh, coconut crown localization, IRM reported precision of 97.3% of uh, MAP, recall of 92% MAP, and F1 score of 0.945. In case of crown classification, IRM model got 84.64% uh, accuracy, which is 4.33% uh, more accuracy than uh, ERM-based model. So in conclusion, IRM-based model gave better performance than ERM-based model in both crown localization and the classification. Thank you. Uh, we have covered all the agenda of uh, today's task, uh, today's talk. Now I will hand over it to uh, Professor Neelam. Man. Dear Samvad organizer, now we are done with the uh, agenda for the day. Thank you, Neelam. Uh, a big hand of applause for the speakers today. Thank you so much. I have one question. Please. I'm just uh, curious about the last part. Uh, what do you do? Uh, I mean, for the color images, is there a specific color model that you use? Or? No, these are RGB. Just RGB. And yeah. you run it as is in the in your uh, as is. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Neelam. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. We'll close. Yeah.